Hello and welcome back. I'm Wayne. This is Spezia Roma. There's so much to talk about with Serie A today. And we're going to be previewing this one, taking a look at probable lineups, as well as who's in, who's out, sadly, uh, as well as a little bit about Luca Gotti, the coach of Spezia. <laughs> All right, recent form has been pretty good for the Giallo Rossi. We know that they have taken out Genoa in the Coppa Italia. They'll be progressing there. They beat Fiorentina last weekend, red card or not. They open up by beating Bologna to the new year. And then there's a draw against Milan. So all intensive, honestly, it's pretty good. It's been pretty solid. Have we seen the true Roma just yet? No, and I'm always talking about like, is this the finished product of Mourinho? No, of course. There is still a lot of work to do. There's going to be some switching around with the personnel as we're going to see in this game. Maybe a chance for even some of the young players. But for Spezia, they've been these draw experts. They keep grinding them out. And honestly, Spezia is a good team. I think they might get this rap because of their name, because people are less familiar with them, because of their Serie A pedigree is not as strong. But they do have really, I would say, dangerous players. Look at Mbala and Zola. This guy's really good. He's the second highest goal scorer in Serie A with nine goals. Really big stuff from him. And if we look at their recent form, it's all draws. Drawing Lecce, drawing Atalanta in the league. Uh, winning their last one against Torino, though. And before that, in the Copa, they lost against Atalanta. It's funny you see there. They drew against Atalanta in the league. But when it came time for the Copa Italia, you see where the depth is actually does play off but Roma has been beating up on the little guys and by little guys I mean in the bottom half of the table no side in Serie A has earned more points than the Giallo Rossi when it comes to the bottom half 25 and they're just level with Inter and Napoli in this regards uh, but Spezia have lost just once on home soil on the Ligurian coast so they've been pretty putting up a really really good fight and uh, I've seen that stadium it looks like a cool one I've been to um, a handful in Italy, but Spezia, since they're a newer team, never been out there, never, honestly, never been in that area either, but it's intriguing. It's really pretty right on the Italian Gold Coast, as they sometimes call it. So if you've been out there, let me know. I want to hear what you think of like Genoa and that area as well. It looks really, really pretty. Um, Cinque Terre as well is over there. So Luca Gotti, 55 years old, interesting manager that they got here. He was actually the assistant to Maurizio Sarri in the 2018-19 season with Chelsea. And that was a very good team, if you remember. And then he actually goes the next season to Udinese. Udinese's manager gets fired. That was Igor Tudor. He takes over, has a pretty good run, decent uh, results there. Takes over for Udinese, becomes the permanent manager the next season, and then is eventually sacked. And this summer, he was hired by Spezia. As I go through Spezia's lineup, there's going to be a couple names that you're familiar with, probably most with Dragovski, the former Fiorentina keeper. Polish, he's grown a lot, I think, in the past two, three years. Amian, Hristov, Caldara. You know Caldara, went to Atalanta. And then has his stint with Milan, doesn't work out so well. Um, home ahead of him on the right wing there is Zarkovsky, Ampadu, good midfielder, and to the left of him will be Burabia. Uh, up top, Reka, Giasi, and Enzola. Of course, Enzola being the most dangerous, though. Giasi's got some legs on him as well. He's had some pretty good Serie A goals over the last few years. For Roma, Patricio, Mancini, Smalling, Ibanez. Ibanez comes back after his yellow card suspension. And then we've got Selic, Cristante, probably Matic, and then Spinazzola out on the left. Of course, you could see Zalewski get uh, put in here. You could see Matic get pulled out and Pellegrini goes further into the deeper role. But I do get this feeling that it could even be Bove who steps in for Matic there alongside Cristante. Bove got the last start against Fiorentina. I thought he added something really special, uh, a real bit of motivation and took the took it to the opponent. And I like that. That was from the get-go. Uh, somebody who wanted to get out there and be athletic and run and try to make some type of dynamic play. And that was very much appreciated, I think, by the fans in Rome as well. Up top, it's looking like Pellegrini Dybala, Abraham. Dybala, of course, super hot form, and Abraham getting there step by step. I've been really proud of him since the start of the new year. The one topic that we can't go without speaking about is Zaniolo's omission from the squad. Supposedly, he has asked to be left out. To me, this is, um, I've been one of Zaniolo's biggest fans because I never want to ever give up on my player. And if this is true about him specifically requesting to not be part of Mourinho's setup, then it, I'm, I'm disheartened because I think that the club has given him a lot. I think that they've been with him every step. The fans have been with him 
all along the way throughout his recovery from his two ACL injuries. And even when he wasn't producing, there's always been this hope that he can get better and that he can improve and become the player that he ought to be. I think he's been a little bit lost in his role this season. However, you have to adapt as a player. If you are a young guy, you're a teenager, and you love playing football, the one thing that I'll tell you is that there's no substitute for hard work, and you have to be able to adapt. And I don't know if at this point in time that Zaniolo is willing to do that, the impression that I get. Of course, what happens behind closed doors is not perfect to me. I don't know exactly the situation. We're only left to reports online, very few that are in English, and those that are in Italian are pretty much echoing the same thing right now. But we do have a really good attack right now and one that seems to be clicking and one that scores 70% of its goals when Zaniolo hasn't been on the pitch. I just want to throw that one on there when it comes to team chemistry and that Pellegrini. I like his role out on the left. I find that with Dybala, he kind of loses maybe his best positioning because I feel that Pellegrini does really good as a trequartista and Dybala often drops back and then into the middle. But uh, anyway, they will figure it out. And I would love to see the presence of Solbach and get in there. I want to see Volpato. So hopefully this game is an opportunity to get some fresh legs. Maybe Roma goes 1 or 2-0 up. And then we could see a little bit more liberty from Mourinho's setup and his lineup there. I'm going to go into Juventus now. And... Forgive me if I'm looking at my screen right here, my little teleprompter, aka my uh, iMac. And I'm going to go all about Juventus. We know that Juventus has been docked 15 points. And that means that Roma are in 6th place automatically. Tied, though, on points with 34 just behind Lazio, who are on 4th. And then Atalanta in 5th. Uh, so this is, this is something that's going to put shockwaves throughout Italian football. Unfortunately, yes, we're glad that Juventus has been docked these points and Roma goes up. However, there are some serious big picture implications to this. So why has this all happened? Why the 15 point deduction? So the FIGC have charged Juventus with inflated transfer fees and then some manipulation. Um, who is complicit? Ex-chairman Andrea Agnelli, Fabio Paratici, who is uh, Tottenham's current sporting director, and what is this? It all comes back to the Prisma investigation. So all of a sudden, in November, Agnelli and all, th all the members of the Juventus board resigned out of nowhere. And we were all shocked. We we're like, this doesn't happen. Something must be going on. So this is the backstory. Juventus issues, issues new shares for a combined 700 million euros to stabilize the club's finances post-COVID. Of course, all of these teams lost so much money after and during COVID, because football wasn't being played, no gate receipts, etc. Then you have to remember that Juventus is a publicly traded company, so they have to be completely transparent. This means that when they put in that new, those new stocks to be bought, this cash injection, uh, that they were obliged to allow Italy's financial regulator, known as CONSAB, to examine the revenues from players' registration rights, since they are this publicly traded company. Then Kobisak, who is another regulator watching over Italian football, sent the FIGC, the Italian uh, Federation, 62, 62 transfers from the previous year. The FIGC's disciplinary commission then took a closer look to see if these were inflated or not. They were getting the impression. And 42 of those transfers involved, you guessed it, Juventus. One of the most notable being the Pjanic Arthur swap. We were all looking at those fees, something like, I don't know, 50 or 60 million for those com combined in the finances. And we're like, how are these players worth that? And that's because they're showing this, this to their books as, oh, look, we've satisfied the year. We, we sold this player. But meanwhile, the new player that they've signed, so so if it's uh, Artur, then they could put that amortized, meaning over the course of the contract. If it's a four or five year contract, they don't have to report that the same way that they have it when it goes out. So they could show, oh, we made this sale just this calendar year, but the purchase that they made is reflected over installments. That's the big issue here. Um, so it was mostly young players though. And there, there's so many players to go through. Uh, I think Mandragora was one of them. Uh, but at the same time, there's another investigation taking place. And this was called Prisma. This, uh, this was launched by the prosecutor's office in Torino. And this is where things got really bad. And they brought allegations of false accounting, 
false financial statements and market manipulation against Juventus. Then they ordered a search and a seizure uh, where they raided the club's training grounds in not just Torino, but also Milan. Everyone went under investigation under, uh, after this. Agnelli, Paratici, and even Pavel Nedved, the club's ex-VP uh, there. The wiretaps. This is, it's not good. Uh, Cedubini, he's a recruitment staff member for Juventus. Gabasio, he's the club's attorney. They start discussing if they, that the people will jump down their throats, meaning probably the prosecutor's office, if they find about the carta secreta or the secret document involving Cristiano Ronaldo. Speculation only gives us the idea, the impression that this is probably, I don't want to call it hush money, but it's, it's a backdoor deal where Juventus said, hey, look, we saved 90 million. Our players cut their salaries for, I think it was April, May, and June of that year because they weren't playing. So the players actually made this deal with the clubs, but that's not reality. The reality is what the prosecutor's office is saying here now is that Juventus only, or the players only agreed for one month. So they had this agreement on paper, but in reality, they only had to cut wages for one month and the money was being passed to them outside of the financial books. So it wasn't being seen. Uh, it's these salary maneuvers, bonuses, and financial accounting, which makes this a three-headed monster for Juventus. Of course, the club has issued a statement denying any wrongdoing. And if you've been reading the news today as well, you know that Juventus will appeal to this. However, it's, it's a terrible image for the league, of course. And it really kills me because it happens to consistently be Juventus stirring the pot. I'm 16 years old in 2006, and I remember Calciopoli like it was yesterday. Uh, it's very frustrating for me as a fan, not just of Roma, but also of Italian football, because with a clean image comes more trust. With more trust, you can have more transparency. And with that, it's a better product. And if it's a better product, the, club, the, the team and the country and the league is going to make more money. Why do we need more money? Well, have you seen how much money that the Premier League has made? Um, I'm sorry, has spent this past transfer market? Compare that. I think it was, I will even get you the, the figure. I'll write it down in the comments, um, but it's a staggering amount. Meanwhile, Serie A, La Liga clubs, Germany has spent virtually nothing. And you start to think about, is the Super League the only way forward? That sounds like a topic for a different episode, but uh, guys, give this one a like, a thumbs up. Let me know about your thoughts on the situation as well. But tomorrow, the main story is that Roma must go to Ligu the Ligurian Sea and beat Spezia, a team which has been pretty difficult to beat. Once again, they've lost just once at their home this season. So let's go do it. I think Roma have all the equipment. They're ready. Uh, put away all the noise from what's going on off the pitch right now. Go and play the way that they have been, which honestly has been uh, getting better little by bit. Little by little. Right? Better... Little, little by little, step by step, you know what I'm trying to say. Bye. <laughs>